Well, very good. I think we'll get started. Um, a small crowd. We know it's a wonderful summer day out there, and apparently we're competing with sports. <laughs> so, uh, but we appreciate you coming, and as people do come in, I apologize if they disrupt you. So, um, you're all adults. Work, work it out. Um, but good evening. We're very pleased um, in the context of Edessa Handelis's exhibition, The Milliner's Daughter, to host this panel discussion about identity and memory in art and life, in the past and present. Speaking of identity and memory, before we go further, the power plant acknowledges the traditional keepers of the land on which it was built, the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the Six Nations of the Grand River, Huron-Wendat, Métis, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and any other nations who cared for the land, acknowledged and unacknowledged, recorded and unrecorded. So good evening. My name is Josh Human, and I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs here at the Power Plant. I hope you'll join me in recognizing all of those who make programs such as this evening's panel discussion possible. CIBC is our primary education sponsor. Uh, we receive institutional support from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council. BMO supports our all-year, all-free admission, which allows free year-round access to the gallery. And TD supports a two-year fellowship for an emerging professional in museum education, a post currently held by Tim Chandler, who helped organize this evening's event. We also thank our members. So members uh, receive, uh, in addition to coming to free programs such as this, uh, free admission to almost all of our other programs, um, even if they're ticketed for the general public. So if you like what we're doing and you're not yet a member, uh, we hope that you'll consider becoming a member. But turning to tonight's panel, the power plant's current exhibition, Edessa Handelis, The Milliner's Daughter, is rich with references to the past, but it's firmly rooted in contemporary art and life. The artist has gathered conducted detailed research about, and has artfully arranged objects, old and new, to build narratives with universal connections, but also with secrets to be discovered. But who we are, where we fit into the community and society, what we remember, and how we are remembered seem to be core questions to consider. So I'm pleased tonight to introduce the moderator of our discussion, and she'll then go on to introduce our panelists. Dr. Shelley Hornstein is Professor of Architectural History and Visual Culture at York University. Among her research interests are themes located at the intersection of memory and place in architectural, mediatized, and urban sites. She's currently writing a book entitled Sightseeing, Monumental Itineraries and Architectural Tourism as an investigation of memory at material, tangible, and intangible places. Dr. Hornstein has published five previous books, including Image and Remembrance, Representation in the Holocaust, which we have included in our reading room, which is typically in this area right there, uh, with tables and other publications that relate to our current exhibitions. She's recipient of awards including the Walter L. Gordon Fellowship and the inaugural e-learning award for the School of the Arts, Media, Performance, and Design at York University in 2014. So please welcome our moderator and panelists. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Josh so much for organizing this evening and I must give credit to Josh and of course to Tim as well from what I understand that the composition of those who are here with us tonight, the panel, um, was really your invention, and um, I owe you a great deal of uh, thanks for that because I feel it's a, a really fabulously diverse group of people from different perspectives, and I think we're going to have a very entertaining evening. Um, I won't, we won't keep you too long because I know you want to get outside more than anything else. So uh, with that, let me just say that um, we welcome, of course, these three speakers who come from very different backgrounds and very different interests sometimes overlapping, I hope we'll see that tonight, and sometimes very far afield. 
um, from each other. This adds, of course, to the excitement that I was mentioning because we want to encourage multiple approaches to the theme. Um, <clears throat> in fact, each of our speakers has been invited to address three, not only two that were advertised, in other words, um, uh, sorry, memory or remembrance and difference, but also uh, a third one that I'm going to come to in a moment. Um, these are complex terms that I'll talk about uh, that bubble up frequently in academic, in museum, in archival, in literary, in cultural, and in scientific spheres regularly of late. Um, and the terms are then identity or identity politics, we could extend it to mean that, memory, of course, and difference, those three terms. And if you've been subjected to TV ads uh, most recently by Ancestry.com, uh, I think you're all too well aware of the intriguing notion of exploring your own DNA uh, to determine your roots. Um, and this is, of course, a seriously complex notion. Suffice it to say that what we remember and how we convey what we remember is definitely the focus of tonight's panel. And your DNA may not tell you all of that. So um, <clears throat> I just g give you a tiny little quote from uh, Yoram Yerushalmi who said, and perhaps most poetically, we ourselves are periodically aware that memory is amongst the most fragile and capricious of our faculties. So collective memory, cultural memory, identity, politics, difference, these are the terms that taken together with work on memory network circuits in the brain are worth exploring in a museum context such as the power plant. Collective experience was broached initially early in the early days in the 30s by Frederick Bartlett and Maurice Halbwax, um, especially Halbwax, because he reinforced the idea that memory, memory narratives in particular, adhere to a group and thus are considered the what he called the social frameworks of memory. Pierre Nora, another uh, writer, theorist, historian in France, for his part, expressed the idea of the lieu de mémoire, or the site of memory, as has been translated in English, where physical sites, he said, um, act as the tangible place where, and I'm quoting him, where the intangible, the symbolic, and the cognitive aspects of a society or a group are bound together. So think, for example, of a, a memorial, right, which is a site that is tangible, that somehow collects together all these symbolic, cognitive, and social aspects of a group. So in this way, that site then acts as the glue of a collective, of a group, of a nation, of identity building. And my own work, um, I wish I could say I wrote five books. I didn't, I'm sorry, but I love that you said I did. Um, <laughs> It's only three, I'm sorry. But in one of those books, my, and, and in others that are forthcoming, uh, the ideas that I follow te technically and foundationally spin on that inspiration from Pierre Nora, and that is that place, and specifically objects and material things that are in place, trigger memory. So many powerful networks of the theories of memory have flooded our entry level understanding of memory. And yet this gravitational pull that we feel regarding themes of loss or collective or global amnesia after our writer uh, such as Andreas Huysen, ghosted places, recovered memory, remembering or re-remembering, nostalgia, sites of memory, the history versus memory debate, in other words, what creates the past for us? How do we know the past? What is the past? Is it based on historical facts or is it based on our memory, factual information, so-called factual information that has been discounted uh, most of the time? What is it that uh, constitutes the past or our knowledge of it and so forth? All of these topics of discussion related to memory continue to intrigue us, um, even if we've been suffocated at times by the kind of obsessiveness and repetitive enunciation of the very word memory. In fact, this has led many to a fear, a fear of forgetting, actually. Uh, and for those of us who have witnessed memory loss in loved ones, it's difficult, in fact, it's very gut-wrenching to experience someone who's losing a sense of memory, right? Of losing a sense of themselves, um, where who they are, and I'm going to use the present tense, who they are becomes who they were. 
where the names and places that they're trying so hard to remember no longer register, or they register only sporadically, and one's own engraved sense of self evaporates. It's, it's a terribly powerful moment to experience that, that sense of loss. So is the loss of memory then the loss of identity? And what of our third term then for this evening, difference, because I focused on the other two. What is it that separates ourselves uh, from others or that which is incommensurable? Well, there's things like borders and interstitiality, there's hybridity, there's colonialisms, there's subjectivities, all those big words. There's self, there's other, there's essentialisms. All these terms relate somehow to the notion of difference. Are we witnessing, as some might suggest, um, and as Radstone and Schwartz had written in 2010, an unprecedented politicization of memory. And that this politi politicization, if I can even say it, reinforces differences in social groups. The way memories are remembered, in other words, right? The way memories of one group are incommensurable with the memories of another. One group survives, another group is erased. One heritage is preserved, another one disappears, right? What we choose to protect, let's think of archeological sites, for example, what we choose to protect becomes the history that we remember. What we choose not to protect is erased. Um, and so, for example, if we think of Aleppo in recent tragic uh, Syrian history, uh, the archeological sites that have been destroyed um, is really the erasure of a culture that it represented. Does this mean that that culture never existed? So uh, where is the place then, or where is the space and place of cultural difference? Some argue it's a neutral territory where historical memory and cultural difference are etched, as well as the place where uh, that which we organize uh, society within uh, is maintained. This has allowed for space and place to be rather invisible. In other words, we generally don't think about the spaces and the places where things happen. We look at the things that are in those places, dare I say, in museums, for example, right? I mean, we always talk about the white cube, or we had talked about, I know mean, there's various strategies in muse museology, museum curating perspectives and so on. But generally, we talk about the way in which that um, exhibition, let's say, occupies a space, of course, but the space becomes almost secondary. Not always, of course not, but there have been many moments where that has been the case. I leave that up to your, I'm sure that'll percolate some discussion, but in any case. Uh, so, so I'm asking, where is the space and the place where these things happen, where this takes place? Um, <clears throat> what is the difference, uh, or let me just say it another way, if we accept that places are neutral, or are autonomous after uh, anthropologists like Gupta and Ferguson, uh, then we conceal the topography of power, as they state. All right, and then there is this, memories and our brains. Um, this is the most complex addition to our agenda this evening, I think. In other words, how do our brains make memories? What is the difference between long and short-term memory insofar as cultural memory is concerned? What are the neural circuits up to? I hope Dr. Snyder is gonna help us or put me straight in what I don't know. Um, does cultural, or what is the relationship between seeing or experiencing this exhibition visually or generally sensorially and consolidating that experience as memory? Um, as a scientific circuited feature of our brains. Does cultural memory impact on how memory is stored? Does the way in which neural circuits operate shape what we select as memorial thoughts? Is there a way to come to terms with imagination and memory? So at this point, it's where I can plug into the extraordinary exhibition behind this wall uh, by Yadessa Hendley's um, I don't know if all of you have seen the show. You may not get a chance tonight. <laughs> no, you won't get a chance tonight, but if you haven't seen it, please go see it, The Milliner's Daughter. And the work of Henley's is complicated and rich, of course, in a series of kind of short stories or vignettes or orchestral movements. Each room, each installation 
threads into the next. These places that she constructs are imagined places with assembled found objects. And in fact, where the term found is not even sufficient, indeed, these objects are meticulously sought after and collected. They are indeed, we could say, collectibles that tell their own stories. And when brought into the same space with each other, tell other stories. Whether they are autobiographical, we cannot be sure, but it matters less than the ability to see the connections she suggests between them, or the blurred boundaries that meld one into the next, leading us to question our place, our sense of home, our sense of identity, our memory of what was, what is, and how this means anything at all. These collectible uncollectibles are arguably unemblematic. There's a kind of enchanting or enchanter function um, at work here, tempting us with visual diversions and at the same time wholly, the, whole, the exhibition is wholly allegorical. They do not seem to emerge from a kind of normative pattern with which we might be familiar. Oddly, the objects that uh, Yadessa Handelis gathers together in this exhibition theatricalize normalcy. Uh, by emitting sensorial triggers, I would think. Think nostalgia or think a haunting quality of the past. Think exhibition displays that return to archival collections. Think the preciousness of objects that reverse what we typically take to be precious. And what might be categorized as the emblematic, but they are positioned, it seems to me anyways, to signal exactly the reverse. That is, their distance and their disruptive nature of what we take to be familiar. And as such, they're organized across between all these borderlines that I mentioned earlier of places of ideas that are familiar and mostly unfamiliar. As viewers, we have to work really hard to put these puzzles together and ex exit with some kind of logic um, so that we feel a sense of comfort, a relief maybe, uh, but I think it doesn't come. Handley's has a propensity, in fact, for thematic multiples to fraction her messages rather methodically. We're pierced by the images we organize ourselves with, uh, we're pierced by the images, sorry, that we organize ourselves with the objects that she presents to us in these spaces. Um, and we become the site of the exhibition. We're the ones who must configure our own thoughts, our boundaries, our differences, our, our beings. And by reconceptualizing space, which I want to declare we need to make visible space, she demonstrates what Ernst von Alphen named the Holocaust effect, or the emptying out of subjectivities, while foregrounding them and the exploration of alternatives to the historical process through imaginative work that she presents to us in an effort to perform or to present the past. Handelis makes this visible through conjunctions of cultural identity, memory, and difference. Let me present to you our three speakers tonight. Uh, we're going to begin uh, in the order uh, that you see everyone here, Dr. Carson Phillips, Jessica Karuhanga, Karuhanga, Karuhanga and uh, Dr. Abe Snyderman. And let me introduce each one of them to you first. Um, Carson Phillips is the managing director of the Newberger Holocaust Education Center and the recipient of scholarly awards, including the 2013 BMW Canada Award from the Canadian Center for German and European Studies at York University. He completed a PhD in humanities, utilizing archival resources, memoirs, testimony, exploring post-Holocaust conce conceptualizations of masculinity. Dr. Phillips is an editorial board member of PRISM, which is an inter interdisciplinary journal for Holocaust educators and an expert on Holocaust education and pedagogy. From 2009 to 14, he was a delegate to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. He recently concluded, in fact, a fellowship, a research fellowship with the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute. Jessica Karuhanga is an artist currently based in Toronto. Her practice undulates, as she says, between performance, video, drawing, and sculptural processes. She holds a BFA in honors from the University of Western Ontario, now Western, yes, <laughs> and an MFA from the University of Victoria. Her visual art and performance work have been presented at various centers throughout Canada, including Royal BC Museum, Deluge Contemporary Art, 
Armure, OCAD US Student Gallery, OCAD University Student Gallery, Videofag, Electric Eclectics, X Space Cultural Center, and NIA Center for the Arts. And finally, Dr. Abe Snyderman is director. Uh, is a, sorry, is a, a, a director of the Neuropsychiatry Clinic Neuro Rehabilitation Program at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, the Department of Psychiatry and Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is a psychiatrist and director of the Neuropsychiatric Psych Clinic in Toronto, uh, in Toronto Rehabilitation Institute's Neuro Rehabilitation Program, where he has worked for the past 16 years. He's also a consultant to the Acquired Brain Injury Stroke Continuing Care and Spinal Cord Injury Programs at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and several community agencies. A clinician, teacher in the Departments of Psychiatry and Medicine at the University of Toronto, Dr. Snyderman was co-winner of the Department of Psychiatry's Ian Sil uh, sorry, Ivan Silver Award for Excellence in Mental Health Education in 2007. His expertise is in the cognitive, emotional, and behavioral effects of neurological problems such as multiple, multiple sclerosis, stroke, severe traumatic brain injury, and seizure disorders. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Carson to begin, and what we'll do is have each of our presenters speak for about five to ten minutes, and then we will open it up to questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Shelley, and thank you for power plant for this invitation to be part of this discussion this evening. Um, so as you know, I work with Holocaust survivors and at the New River Holocaust Education Center. And just as there is no one monolithic um, survivor experience, also there is no one monolithic Holocaust survivor mode of remembrance or mode of memory. Although we do know that remembering the events of the Holocaust was always something that was extremely important to those who lived through it. And we know that there were re uh, recordings being done in the displaced person camps after the Holocaust, but we also know that even while the Holocaust was taking place in concentration camps or in ghettos, we know that there was a, d a drive to leave behind written accounts, visual accounts, artistic accounts, to document, to record, to leave behind something um, of almost as evidence of the time. So if we could flip to the very first slide, thank you. Thank you very much. It may be a little bit difficult to see, but this is actually uh, sort of a, a painting drawing with pastels that was done on one of the barracks in Birkenau by an unknown prisoner, but who had arranged to have some type of very basic art supplies smuggled in with her. It's in the women's barracks, so it's believed to have been uh, done by a woman artist. Um, and it's really documenting the, uh, the accounts of slave labor that were carried on. So this, we sort of have to think about someone who's living through this experience of being a slave laborer in Birkenau, and at the same time, on the ceiling of the barracks, when they go back to their barrack bunk at night, is then recording this, and it still survives today. You can see it if you go through some of the barracks. It's really a remarkable account, I think, of this human resiliency and spirit to be able to want to leave behind something that documented these events. So what I want to share with you this evening are some reflections based upon um, you know, my work in the field of Holocaust education and remembrance, and in particular in working uh, with Holocaust survivors. Uh, late last year, our center officially launched a collection of recorded oral histories um, that were recorded by Holocaust survivors here in Toronto that were recorded in the 1980s and into the 1990s. It makes it one of the earlier collections in North America, predating even the Shoah Foundation uh, recordings. And it was in fact part of a much larger project in which we partnered with the Montreal Holocaust Museum to digitize, preserve, and make accessible over 1,200 recordings from small collection holders across Canada. And you can imagine that these recordings were primarily of an analog method. They were on VHS tapes, on beta tapes, uh, some on pneumatic tapes, and really had not been accessed 
since the time that they were recorded back in the 80, late 1980s, mid 1980s into the 90s. And if we could flip ahead to maybe this slide. So here are some of the people that I work with as they look today. And we'll flip to the next one. Uh, these are some of the people who recorded their testimonies. And keep in mind that these people, these individuals, some of them are still speaking today, but they were much younger at that time. So there's three aspects, I think, specifically about this collection and tonight's themes of remembrance and memory that came to mind or come to mind when I work with this collection, because I, I'm been working with this project for about five years of seeing it from, from start to completion. So first of all, the first observation is that the details with which the narratives are relayed or the memories are retold, events are recalled in this collection are incredibly rich and incredibly detailed. And even for those of us who are working is really immersed in the field, we were surprised about the recall and the detail um, from some of these recordings. And as you can see, perhaps from some uh, two of these screenshots you see here, many of these individuals were in their 50s and 60s at the time. You know, today these same individuals are in their 80s and the 90s. And they were recording these experiences, these memories, these recollections of the Holocaust, perhaps 40, 40 plus years after the event. Um, the second observation is that for many of these survivors, this was really, if not the first time, one of the first times that they recorded their testimony or told about their testimony, their experiences in the Holocaust in a formal setting. And you can imagine that for many of these individuals, they're recalling very traumatic events. And this was not an easy process for them to go through. And this comes through in many of the recordings. You see individuals who are struggling to find the correct vocabulary, the correct word to describe what they went through. Because at this point, they may not have formed the correct word in English as not their second language, in many cases their third or fourth language. And even just to be able to, to describe the magnitude of what had happened to them, they're still searching for that vocabulary to be able to put it into words. So it's really looking at um, a window. It almost gives us a window into looking at very, very early recordings. Today, some of these same speakers have been speaking at our center since 1985. And so you can imagine the process of telling the story today is very different than when it was back in 1985. And that leads to the third observation that for some people who record it, they record it once and they never perhaps spoke publicly again. They may have spoken to friends or perhaps in their own community synagogue, but they never spoke publicly to school groups and students again. But they felt it was important to leave behind a recording. Um, and we do know from looking at the, these recordings that some people record it more than once. It's also possible to find within this collection, this 1200 collection, which has now been archived and preserved with the USA Shoah Foundation, we can find with some individuals multiple recordings. They record it at different times in their lives. And I think this is something which scholars are now delving into, how this narrative may be different when it was first recorded in 1985 to opposed to 1990, perhaps again in 1995. So we're starting to see some, Noah Shanker from the US has done some very early work in, in comparing testimonies over time. Uh, so from this overview, I think there's a few important details about this recording of oral history, this recording of memory, how memory is recalled and remembrance. So first, there were some, as I've said, who recorded once and they never became active speakers again. They wanted to leave behind this record. There were some who actually, when we go back in to look at the archival documents that support the collection, they considered telling their narratives and they filled out the uh, pre-recording interview. They met with an interviewer, but later decided not to go through with the recording, perhaps because reliving the worst part of their life was simply too traumatic to be recorded and they chose not to, understandably. And third, we have a much smaller selection or smaller grouping of these individuals 
who continued to speak and did so over many years. So we have many speakers from this collection, not many, but we have a number of speakers who recorded in the mid-1980s and are still alive and still speaking at our center today. They may have recorded, as I've said, multiple testimonies with multiple oral history collections. And I think here we are witnessing perhaps a healing um, through the recording of memory, the recall of events in a number of ways. For some, the process of remembering, the process of recalling, repeating uh, events that had happened to them, even of this very personal traumatic nature, when speaking about the Holocaust, it was really integral to their healing process. One survivor who I work with and have worked with very closely for about 10 years um, remarked to me that, and this is a direct quote from her, she says, you cannot run away from the past. In fact, it runs alongside of you. It's always with you. It's only when you stop and face it that you can begin to heal. And this was one of her motivations for actually speaking about it, was to begin this healing process. For others, speaking and remembering really became an act of bearing witness, not only to the events of the Holocaust, but for those who did not survive. So we have almost a, a sort of a collective voice. They're speaking not only for themselves, but for their family members, their relatives, their community members who were murdered in the Holocaust, who have no voice. And so for others, this act of leaving behind a recorded oral history was in itself their act of remembrance. I think a second catalyst, and perhaps no less important in, in this connection to remembrance and memory, um, we had many survivor speakers who have told us, who perhaps even in the recordings, if not afterwards, that the catalyst was in order to respond to the Holocaust denial movement that was fairly active in Toronto in the mid-1980s, even into the 1990s, you may have heard on the news this week that Ernst Zundel had, had died, or died in Germany, and he was certainly at the forefront of Holocaust denial, spreading propaganda throughout Toronto and went through two trials in Toronto in 85 and again in 1988. And many of these individuals came forward uh, to record their testimonies, not because they wanted to, but because they saw it as not just as an act of remembrance, but as an act of testimony. And so here, the events that they were recalling would go on record and would provide this oral history account of what had happened. It was their way of countering Holocaust denial. And so today, with fields such as memory studies emerging, I think as really a significant trend, I think we're starting, at least in my field, to witness a, a bit of a shift in remembrance. And I would say perhaps we're moving away at least a little bit from this absolute concern with historical knowledge of events of dates and times and places in chronological order and memory and a shift from what we know to how we remember it and i think you know we're starting to see evidence of this even within the field of holocaust studies there's a book that i'm currently reading called the memory illusion uh, by german canadian sociologist dr julia shaw who says that you may not be who you think you are because of the way that time perhaps shifts some of our memories. And I think with that, we're now in an era where we are delving into these complex issues. Um, you know, one, for example, the development of how trauma narratives, and the Holocaust certainly fits within that, that paradigm of being a trauma narrative, how it reshapes our thinking, how it reshapes our past and our present, how memories may shift or alter over time, perhaps due to books that we've read, perhaps to films that we've seen, other knowledge that we've been exposed to. And even as Shelley had mentioned earlier, um, changes in our memory, our declining powers of memory. And so one of the last sort of elements that I want to raise for discussion this evening, and I think it's one of the most intriguing concepts that this field has opened up for me, is what Marianne Hirsch calls post-memory. And Marianne Hirsch, if you're not familiar, was born in Romania after the Second World War. She immigrated to the US as a teenager. She does a lot of work with what she terms post-memory. And she first used this term in the 1990s 
when she was writing an analysis of Art Spiegelman's Maus series. She describes this as the relationship that the generation after bears to personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who came before. So the experiences that they may remember, but it's not their actual memories. They remember them as stories, as images, as behaviors that they have heard, but they have internalized. And it becomes so integral to their own sense of identity that it becomes for all intents and purposes their own memory, but it's not a memory, which is why she calls it post-memory. Um, so Hirsch, of course, was writing about the memories of Holocaust survivors and how descendants of Holocaust survivors grapple with these experiences. I myself have applied Hirsch's concept to some of my own writing in analyzing and interpreting the written memoirs of the descendants of Nazi perpetrators, which is an entirely different viewpoint, but again, you can imagine it is still a narrative of trauma. And I think I'll end there. I'm not gonna go into literary engagement, but um, one example that I'll perhaps leave you with is what gets left out in memoir, what gets included, and one book that I'm currently reading uh, it's called Buried Words, The Diary of Molly Applebaum, published by the Israeli Foundation, which produces uh, Holocaust survivor memoirs. What is fascinating about this particular book is that they have actually published her diary, Molly Applebaum's diary, which was an account when she was in hiding in Poland, with her much more reflective memoir, which was written much later in life. And What's so fascinating about this for me is that there is a lot within the diary which is left out of the reflective memoir. And I think I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, hi, I'm Jessica. I'm an artist whose um, practice is centered in video, performance, and sculptural processes. So my practice is born out of an impulse or a necessity to respond to place, uh, moment, this apex. Ultimately, I'm enacting meditations on sites, and it is what these sites trigger or conjure that determines form. I mind the sights and scents, sounds, a hue of light, tone of color, and I reassemble them before you, but differently. People ask me all the time, what kind of stories do you want to tell? And I say, exhume those bodies. Exhume those stories. The stories of the people who dreamed big and never saw those dreams to fruition. People who fell in love and lost. Because we are the only profession that celebrates what it means to live a life. summers used to be us as a family swimming in the pool and how happy 
we were. And I guess sometimes you gotta think about that stuff because you remember when you were just like purely happy and just didn't have to stress out about about the dynamic that your family was in because you thought felt safe and you felt secure. So I feel like I feel nostalgia. I feel nostalgia for the feeling of when I was a child and I felt secure and safe and happy and I didn't have any care in the world. I'm really uh, nostalgic about, not necessarily even nostalgia, just like yearn, yeah, I yearn for that feeling and I wish I knew at the time that I should enjoy that feeling because I have, and because of all the stuff that was gonna happen. And like, I guess it makes you look forward to when I have children of my own, I want them to have those memories and then never let those memories get ruined, like the way that those memories have kind of been ruined for me. Yeah. Is that good? Okay, so I'm going to plug this back in now. Get that there. Okay, so my like timing was a bit off there, it was less effective, but we're going to roll with it. Um, I often wonder why, when asked to imagine an alterity to the present state, most are inclined to dwell into their past and especially their origins. They dream of aeons which precede their first breath. They dwell in pools of nostalgia and these pits seem to harbor only certain bodies or fragments of themselves. Others will direct the channel's current into a futurity. These gestures echo modes of self-articulation. The subaltern, a body typically dispossessed and unperceivable, is encouraged to to defiantly carve out space, despite having always already existed, unwavering. We look back on these genealogical trails, the threads we are born of and extend from, to comprehend and justify our presence. Regardless if one chooses to move back or forth when they dream, both possibilities are forms of time travel. Both ends of this channel are alluring and dangerous. Though far from utopic, the future still remains most open and with greater possibility because it is yet to be known. While I struggle to comprehend how I might arrive in this future, understanding my corporeality in the present, I lean toward the belief that resilience moves in one direction. I do not know how to exist here, so I retreat in dreams. In my core brews a, a desire to grasp a world where a bent frame a porous border and a decentering of my body may materialize. Um, so, uh, through a brass channel um, is an illusion. A channel is a passage between two bodies of water. We will undulate these spaces um, and harbor their forces. Through this conduit, the performance m performers, dancers, mine and conjure the refuse of both personal and collective archives and this conjuring reveal the allures and dangers of time travel. Um, so because of the constraints of time, I decided to kind of speak to one of my more recent choreographic installation projects. And this uh, was exhibited at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto. So it's an installation and choreographic project comprised of many elements or sight lines. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put this back. And I'm afraid of as I speak. Okay. So it was an installation and choreography that was exhibited at Art Museum that consisted of two sculptural sculptures. The physical traces are material evidence of the dancers' enactments and rituals, which would shift daily. Um, there was a collaborative performance with uh, Jamaican-Canadian writer Norbeze Philip, 
um, two single channel videos, and a 30 minute audio track, um, which I just sampled you. So the audio track I played for you is called All of Me, and it features the voices of seven black women, cis and trans, whom I admire. And I asked them to speak to Lonnie, um, nostalgia, time travel, trauma, and um, so this mix is made out of layers of choir samples, blues, house and trap beats, and riffs off a lamentation by um, the jazz singer Billie Holiday. And in the song, she's, it's a call to a person she longs um, for to recognize her and love her in her totality. So um, this sampling and reassembling is kind of an extension of a project or series um, that I began last summer, which was called uh, Carefree, Fine and Mellow. And in that project, So in that project, um, it's a collage of uh, found videos archived through the hashtags Carefree Black Girl and Carefree Black Boy. And I use these found videos as cues for a car choreography. Um, the sounds are mostly made of footage, so that the oral, of the found footage, so the oral aspects vary in pitch and tone and quality, indicative of the various devices people use. Um, to document their everyday lives from significant life altering moments to just banal everyday moments. And I felt it necessary to make the sounds and images uh, disjunctive to highlight the materiality um, of, the, of the device and of the hashtag itself, but also in line of a legacy of hip hop to think of this material as um, kind of sounds like abstract sounds and um, to visually reassemble them into musical rhythm. So I mirror the gestures, a hair flip, a whine, a purse lip, and ultimately this project um, is about considering the force of language and shaping our understandings of the world and how carefreeness is something that can be embodied, performed, but also often feels like an impossible task to achieve for the black subject. Um, so currently, I'm invested in sort of uh, these virtual archives and networks of affinity within the framework of social media in real life and how one might sculpt time, how objects become conduits to and elsewhere, as well as the palimpsestic uh, body as well. Thank you. And now for something completely different. <laughs> By the end of this presentation, you guys are going to be neuroscientists in about 10 minutes. <laughs> this is a synthesis of a 90-minute presentation, so we'll try to do it as fast and as concise and less toxic as we can. The reason why I chose this particular picture is that one of the strongest uh, insiders of memory one of the strongest skewing forces of memory is smell. So how do we call smell art? Cuisine, arguably. I mean, I've seen art installations in, in which there's scents and odors, etc. but that, that really doesn't trigger memories as much as a food or a perfume. So I am a fan of art. I'm not very knowledgeable, but I'll do my best not to make a fool of myself in a room full of artists. So this is obviously a very well-known picture, one of the most famous pictures. This is Botticelli, The Birth of Venus, and Botticelli in this painting uh, depicts Venus coming out of the sea, riding a shell, and the god, the demigod Sapphire, which is the wind, the god of wind, and the goddess of whisper pushing her while that assistant is ready to cover her up. And whenever I used to see this picture, I always thought to myself from a very young age, was Botticelli there? I mean, obviously he couldn't have been there because he's mythological, so he couldn't have seen what was happening. So how on earth did he get this particular memory? How on earth did he get this particular imagery? 
So we go to the next famous picture, and everybody has seen this one. You see it in mugs, in t-shirts, in shorts, and socks, etc. So again, when I would see this picture, I go, well, yes, it's not interpretive per se, but what did Munch see? And as it happened, he was standing at the pier in Oslo with a couple of friends, and they saw this magnificent sunset in which the sea next to the pier almost lit up in red colors. So this is how in he interpreted it. The question is, obviously, he was not at that point in time carrying a camera, there were none. He was not capturing the image in any other way except his memory. So what did actually, what did he see, what did he encode, and how did he translate this into image? And everybody knows this one, and what did Salvador Dali see? Well, Dali was Dali, who knows? It's open to interpretation, the flexibility of time, the fluidity of time, but this is a good example of how abstract your memory can be. Clearly he's remembering clocks and watches and mountains and sunsets. Clearly he's integrating this into a painting, but he wasn't actually there because that's a completely surrealistic picture, so how did he remember this? So I'm going to play a trick on the audience, and I'm going to test you guys. You're not aware you're being tested, but you are. So this is the time when I ask for a volunteer, and nobody raises their hands, so I'm not going to. All I'm going to ask is to face the fact that you're looking at a picture of a woman in the 19th century, okay? So keep looking at her, and just for the sake of argument, I'm going to call her with a name starting with the letter A. So let's famous artist, let's call her Adele. So you got it, you encode it in your memory. This is, who is it? I couldn't hear you. Adele, Adele there you go. We can start singing now. So this is Adele. How do we subdivide human memory from a theoretical point of view is very, very complicated. In the scientific world, wars have started this way. So basically to succinctly uh, explain this, you have sensory memory. So right now, you're sensing the chair, you're sensing the temperature, you're sensing the air, you're sensing, unfortunately for you, my voice. You saw wonderful talks and images and then, but those memories are very quick. Otherwise, your brain will be full in a second. If you were to make conscious all of the information your brain is processing now, you would collapse, your hard drive will melt. Because if I ask the, the, the audience, what is your right big toe doing now? Right now you just made it conscious. But your brain has been constantly monitoring it. And your breathing, and your insulin, and your glucose, and your thyroid level, and your blood, and your blood pressure, and your respiration, and whether Snyderman's gonna shut up eventually or not. So all of that is going subconsciously, um, in what we call sensory memory. Now, short-term memory, how many of you have cell phones? How many of you have received a phone call, see the number or the name, hung up, do something else, go back, and what was that phone? That's short-term memory. So what we call working memory. Last less than a minute, very easy to see, very easy to retrieve in the first minute or so, very difficult to recall. This is what gives us the most trouble as we age, short-term memory. Long-term memory lasts a lifetime. So all of the Holocaust survivors, and I'm the grandson of Holocaust survivors, so I know what they went through. Um, most of my family on my mother's side was lost in the Holocaust. And these are, these are people who, are corroborating what Carson was saying, that they don't, do not like to talk about it. War survivors, soldiers, Nowadays, PTSD is a big, big topic in my field. All of the people that have been involved in traumatic experiences, whether it's a rape, an assault, a war, don't like talking about it. Because that memory, as you'll see later on, is encoded very, very deeply in an emotional center of the brain, so it triggers emotions. So long-term memory, we can divide further into explicit or conscious memory, or implicit or conscious memory, or what we call declarative memory, which is facts and events. In other words, what I can test you with. If I show you a list of numbers and I ask you to remember them, that's facts, events, that's declarative memory. Procedural memory is, 
if I give Jessica a pen and I ask her, what do you do this with? And she'll say, well, I, I write with it. That's procedural memory. That's what we call praxis. And in some patients with strokes or brain injuries or other neurological conditions, they forget how to do that. So Alzheimer's patients, memory disorders patients, at the end of the, the illness, they forget how to even brush their teeth. They become a praxis. And that's procedural memory. Furthermore, the declarative memory is divided into episodes and semantic. So episodes are events and experiences. Semantic is facts and concept, more abstract. So those two have to come together in order for us to be able to remember. Any questions so far? Have I confused you enough? Now, this is an MRI that has been sort of washed through a very new fantastic software in which every single fiber of the white matter gets painted. So with this very sophisticated algorithm, we can see that the great matter around the brain is widely connected by white matter. And if you think of white matter, it's nothing else than cables. Those are the axons of the neurons, but there's billions of them. So in order for us to conceptualize the brain these days, it's more useful to not think of the brain as a computer with a hard disk, but rather with a massive, massive network. The days in which, yes, this part of the brain does this part of the thinking, it, they're still there, but we're starting to understand that it's a network. Every part of the brain is connected. What on earth is the C uh, horse, <coughs> excuse me, doing in a presentation of uh, Idessa Hendelis, bear with me. Uh, in the early days of the neuroanatomies, when they were dissecting brains, somebody saw this particular part of the brain called the hippocampus. And hippocampus in Greek means seahorse. This is what gives you your memory. This is the hard disk of your memory, the hippocampus. <coughs> Excuse me. If we put the microscope to the hippocampus in a particular area called the dentin gyrus, we see all of these blobs. Now, this is not a Christmas brain. This is basically, again, the same software in which each cell was given a different color depending on the type of cell. So one of these blobs is a neuron. And you can see how densely packed these neurons are in the centers of memory and how interconnected they are. So how do we form a memory? <clears throat> in the hippocampus, the stem cell, anybody has heard of stem cells lately? They're in the media every other day. A stem cell is a mother cell, basically. It's a cell that can convert itself into anything. A stem cell becomes a neural precursor, a neuroblast, an immature neuron, and then becomes an, kind of like an adolescent neuron, and then a mature neuron. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once the neuron matures, it starts connecting with pre-existing neurons. Now, <clears throat> if we think of computers, computers work in a digital age with zeros and ones. That's called digital. Digit means number. So it's one, on, zero, off. That doesn't mean anything. But if we have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, that means A. Or zero, zero, one, one, that might mean Z. This is the same way this, the brain functions. A neuron turns on, a neuron turns off. That's all it does. But when you have 100 billion neurons with trillions of connections, and you connect this with this with this with this, and they stay connected, that's a memory. Now, all of this is electrochemical. All of, all of this is electrochemical, very complex biochemistry that I'm not going to get into. But essentially, we're a walking blob of chemicals in the sea of fat. That's your brain. <laughs> the brain is full of fatty tissues called phospholipids. That's what we are. Now, poets in this room will kill me, but poets are wrong. Feelings are not in the heart, they're in the brain. Now, it's a heartache sounds much better than it's a brain ache. So you broke my heart sounds better than you broke my brain. So I can, I can get the artistic liberty to that. This is how the very primitive area of the brain almost like the reptilian brain looks like. It's in the center of your brain and it consists 
of many, many complex areas, and this is the hippocampus that you saw before, and by now you know the hippocampus, so you pass a test in neuroanatomy. And this hippocampus is connected to this structure called the amygdala. Amygdala is an almond in Greek. So it's the shape of an almond, about the size of an almond, and without the amygdala you die. Why would you die? In Toronto you would cross the street without fear and you will get hit in about 2.5 seconds. Uh, in other parts of the world you wouldn't be alive more than 10 seconds without the amygdala. That's a fear center. I've had patients with seizure disorders in the amygdala that have terror seizures, in which the seizure presents itself as a, more than a panic attack, either a rage attack or a terrifying experience, and it's a seizure because the amygdala gets activated. Now, you can see how interconnected the amygdala is to the hippocampus. So why would the center of memory be connected to the center of rage? If, you have, if you're married, you know the answer. You have long memories and can still, at least in my wife, the, he, she can still remember stuff I did 30 years ago that I have no idea what I did, but I say, yes, dear. So that's my survival mechanism. So from an evolutionary point of view, it was absolutely necessary that a gazelle or a prehistoric animal would detect the scent of a lion. Now, at that point in time, the zebra or the gazelle doesn't have the time to go through the file and say, hmm, I know that scent. That scent is kind of like a lion, but I'm not sure if it's a brown lion or a reddish lion or a male lion or a young, because by then the zebra or the gazelle is lunch. So it's very important that the memory centers are connected immediately to very primitive, almost reflex areas that will allow you to react. So if I scare Jessica and Jessica jumps, that did not go conscious. What comes afterwards will be conscious. I'll get slapped. <laughs> but but that's, that's once your, fam, your, your frontal lobe and the manager of the brain tells you, what the hell, what did this guy do? <laughs> Initially, she would jump, blood pressure would go up, heart rate would go up, her muscles would be full of blood, Sugar will be released, insulin will be released, cortisol will be released, so she's ready to fight or flight. Given her size, I'm not touching that one. But that's why the memory systems have to be attached with fear systems. Now, what do you think will happen if day after day after day after day you are surrounded by horror and uncertainty and you see barbaric acts? and you experience incredible emotional pain. What's that going to do to the memory systems? It's gonna mark them. It's gonna mark them permanently. So soldiers witness atrocities, Holocaust survivors. My grandmother could never ever hear certain passages of Chopin ever without going into a panic attack. For some reason she encoded one of the sonatas with being back in Warsaw couldn't do it. She knows she, she was not there, she was safe. Throughout her life she could not hear Chopin at all. Why? That's the memory, that's the hippocampus acting up. Now, after that there's a whole bunch of network being involved in how you interpret the memory and how you associate the memory with all the things. And that's how you do psychotherapy. You start deconstructing the associations of fear with memory. You start understanding memory with fear. So let's very quickly give you the neurophysiology 101. Let's imagine that you perceive something and that information is sent directly through very sophisticated networks all the way to the visual cortex which happens to be in the back of your brain. You don't see with your eyes, you see with the back of your brain. Just as the wonderful videos we just saw and the music we heard, you're not really seeing the video. Your eyes are catching the light. Your ears are catching pressure waves. The, the tympanic membrane is resonating. It's your brain that's processing that information and converting it from sound or vision to electrical activity. And that electrical activity gets converted into chemical activity that gets stored. So, as I said, the emotional brain 
is crucial. We have mapped the emotional brain very clearly. We know exactly how it works. And we're going to go there. Now, this is a very interesting research paper. Bear with me. It's intimidating. It looks horrendous, but just bear with me. This is a research that was done in Germany. And in this research, they ask people, thank you, they ask people, I'm going to give you this particular object. With your eyes closed, you're going to see what it is, and you're going to determine the shape. But then after 16 seconds, I'm going to show you a second object. And then you're going to have, it after six seconds, you have to tell me whether those two objects are the same. So there's a delay. So they're testing short-term memory. And then they use a temperature discrimination. So again, one object is cold, the other object is, is warmer, and then you have to dis decide. And then they use a very sophisticated tool called a PET scanning, and we see where they're encoding the information in vivo. So while before we have to kill somebody to see their brain or just get them dead and the brain doesn't work, now we can see the brain functioning in vivo. So all of these areas in yellow is where the person was encoding the information. This is where the memory object was being compared. This is where the decision was being made. And this is where all the information got merged. So now we see how we encoding memory in vivo. Who's this? All right, very good. What if I told you that, yes, this is Adele, but what if I gave her another name? How about if I gave her Adele Block Power? And I see a couple of people going, yes. So she's very famous, and she became very famous this last year because she kind of won an Oscar or was nominated for an Oscar for this. Now, you got to give it to Klimt. This is the woman in gold. Now, if I had showed you first the picture and then Adele block, which rumors has it that was Klimt's lover, and she was in another of Klimt's pictures, and this is Klimt, so the woman must have been blind. Who knows? Who am I to say, right? That's Klimt, and he was very popular with the ladies in Vienna. Klimt obviously used her as a model. But if I had showed you the woman in gold first and asked you to recognize the face of Adele in a crowd, you might or might not have been able to. Why is that? I need a volunteer. You. I just volunteered you. You can stay there. You can stay there. What do you see? Damn, she's good. All right, have you seen this picture before? OK. Oh, well, that's cheating, but anyway. What you first saw was fruit. When that fruit is arranged in a particular way, your brain is tricking you. Actually, the artist is tricking you, because the architecture of that arrangement portrays to be a face. What just happened is congratulations. Your right fusiform gyrus is working very well. Yeah. I have patients that have propos proposagnosia, which means prosopo is face, agnosia is lack of knowledge in Greek. If you ever read a book called The uh, Man Who Took His Wife for a Hat, that's what this person had. This is what allows us to recognize faces. In some of my patients with strokes who are perfectly able to recognize the sound but cannot encode the face, that's the problem. Now, another volunteer. Too good. <laughs> OK. An artist. OK? This is the task. I want you to read those words. Now, in the second row, I want you to tell me the color the word is in. Okay. Orange, blue, green, red. You passed. Yes. Now, I want you to tell me the color of the word, not what the word says. Okay. Ready? You're going to go fast. Okay. One, two, three. All of them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> red, blue. Oh, there. Green. I'm yet to see a, a person in an audience that doesn't get to this line and starts cracking up. <laughs> when you realize your brain is telling you, 
We're screwing up here. You better hurry. This is a very difficult test. It's called the Stroop test. It's been around since 1935. And it's a way to see how your frontal lobe is working, how you're encoding information. So first, the first test I ask you just read. You're using your left hemisphere. The second test I ask you, tell me colors. You're using your right. And then I'm going to ask your brain to mix them all. So I'm going to task you with first reading the word which your brain does very quickly. Because at this point in time in your level of, lit of literacy, you're not reading, you're recognizing shapes. That's why you speed read. So at this point in time when you're doing, okay, it says blue but it's green, your frontal lobes is fighting with each other. So you're encoding. Now, how art changes your brain? And I'm almost done. Art changes your brain, and this was very quickly. Again, in Germany, 16 volunteers were told you're going to take a 10-week course on art, and 16 volunteers were told you're going to take a 10-week course on art interpretation. And we're going to do a functional MRI of your brain, which is the first set, before you take the courses, and we're going to compare them afterwards. To make a long story short, the people who took the creative process, who learned art, grew their brains when you compare to the people who interpreted the art. So doing art actually changes your brain. Doing art actually increases the connectivity in particular areas I'm not going to get into. So if you compare the visual art production to the evaluation, you can see how many areas are lighting up here and how many areas are not lighting up there. I don't know what that tells about art critics versus artists. Yeah, there you go. So what do you see? That's my last slide. This is the third place in the National Geographic Photographic Contest of this year. I stole it. I, uh, they lent it to me from The Guardian. What do you see? This is a cave in Patagonia, actually. No filters. But there's a message hidden there. Now I caught your attention, right? And the message is there, but it's too small. But I can tell you that at this point in time, your brain just encoded it. Now, you might not be able to see it because I tricked you and I put it very, very small font, but it's there. So the next time I tell you, where is the message? You know exactly where it is. So you just encoded information. Right now, three, four, five million neurons connected. Now, when I show you the next step, another three, four million neurons are going to connect. And when I show you what it says, your amygdala is going to go, oh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> OK. And that's, that's that. Sorry I ran over time as usual. No, that was great. Thank you. Well, certainly we have enough fodder to continue some sort of discussion. Of course, my challenge is to try and mesh them together somehow. Maybe I can open it up, first of all, to all of you and um, begin with fielding some questions or thoughts. Yes, please. certain facts of art. Okay. Um, yes, you are being overwhelmed. Your brain is telling you we cannot process this information fast enough, either because there's too much information or subconsciously you're processing all sorts of other stuff at that particular day. Either your sugar has dropped or you're not well hydrated or you're cold and you're tired or you're in pain or you were ambivalent about going in the first place or who knows what. Uh, but more often than not, the typical example is a supermarket. You have a thousands of visual stimulation, noise, navigation, geographical orientation, decision process, memory, and oftentimes people feel overwhelmed and they gotta get out of there. 
um, happens to me every time my wife wants to go to a mall. I stay in the car. <laughs> it's normal. Um, why does it happen at particular uh, exhibitions or particular shows? I'm not sure. Might be the content of the actual exhibition. Are there any other thoughts? Yes, I'll ask Josh. A about, um, so about uh, Holocaust survivors and their, and their, let's say, the next generation. Um, based on the experiences that you've had listening to the interviews um, and the testimonials, um, how, how much would you say their experiences have been integrated as part of their identity versus? It's a really, it's a really good question. It's a really tough question. <laughs> um, it really, I think, there's not one simple answer for it. Um, what I can sort of say in a general sense is that I think it depends upon how the information was delivered. Um, so, for example, I've had many, many, say, second G or, or descendants of survivors who will say I was bombarded with this information from a very young age and it was constant through like high school until I went away to university and it was simply too much. You see not always but you do see it more of a, a distance like a very conscious distance. I grew up with this. I no longer want to hear this now. Keep it away from me. Whereas those who may have had information delivered in very short amounts at specific times in their life from their survivor parents are much more in tune to accepting that, that sort of background. I think interestingly, if you skip the second generation and go to the grandchildren, that's where you see a much stronger connection of the desire to know is coming from the grandchildren. Tell me more about that. I would like to know where you were in the Holocaust. It's that th sort of third generation is removed from it, but they're initiating that knowledge rather than having it thrust upon them. Any other, is that a question? Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a, I don't know how to answer this. Uh, it does in certain projects maybe, like I work a lot. I think oftentimes when I'm trying to create an installation or do a performance, I'm thinking of ways in which I can kind of create sort of an aura. So that might be through like a sound, a gesture, a sound, like those are kind of the material reference points that I make. Um, and then I think a lot of my practice is also connected to a kind of storytelling, which um, is also connected to kind of mythologies. And what I mean by that is sort of how stories, through storytelling, these, and these kind of genealogical trails, how things become kind of fractionalized. So if I'm looking towards my, the various communities I inhabit or my family history in those communities, these are things that come up a lot that I can draw analogies to, for sure. Um, you know, having a father who has PTSD, these are things, and maybe part of my impulse to like find that is through kind of this absence of like information. So, um, but how time comes up, um, I, I mean, I could elaborate a bit more about the project that I decided to sort of focus on. A lot of that is a desire to 
kind of dwell into a past, how certain objects, um, you know, or sense, touch, um, hearing can kind of trigger a memory, how objects can kind of become conduits to another place. So, you know, you'll be walking, you'll smell something, or like maybe a locket that is in the family can be this kind of connection to time. So I'll incorporate some of these things into an installation or like an assemblage. So I feel like those are ways in which time kind of plays into it. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Can you just repeat the last sentence? Why is the past? That's an interesting question. Of course, I don't have enough brain cells to figure that out. <laughs> okay, but you know, it's, it's very interesting because, of course, we have Yudessa's show here, which one could say attempts to situate it somewhere in the past, but at the same time, it is very present. Um, my own personal feeling is that there are many exhibitions, it's true, that deal with the past. I, I wouldn't say exclusively at all, but, uh, but, but there is this preoccupation, as I mentioned earlier, with the notion of memory, the notion of the way in which we, as Carson was mentioning, how we interpret the past either through memory uh, narratives, for example, or through history as factually recorded, let's say. Um, uh, so I think there's a, there's a desire to um, work backwards in a sense to try and figure out what the past means today since it may have been presented somewhat, I don't want to say incorrectly, but differently than we may want to understand it. And it helps us to reckon with this present moment, I think. But I think that there are just as many contemporary shows. I mean, I think that's just a way of thinking about why many exhibitions do or are preoccupied with the past. Um, and, I, and I think in many ways it's a, it's a good thing because we're revisiting um, the ways in which we told certain stories and suddenly we have new stories. So it gives us a sense of how um, volatile on the one hand these stories have been, but at the same time how rich the past is to mine, you know, and come up with something very new, come up with information that we didn't have. And I'm sure, Carson, in your work, you see this regularly. Right? Yeah, I would absolutely. And I will quote a former professor of mine who used to say, as historians, we predict the past. and We don't always get that right. And um, I think you're right. We're always accessing new information. There's always a new source, a new document, a new artwork, something that's discovered from the past that we didn't know. And then all of a sudden, it changes the way that we thought about something. When, when the so archives of the former Soviet Union opened up, all of a sudden we started to see how the Holocaust unfolded in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe completely differently than we had imagined it before. And I think those are really important aspects. And also bringing voices from the margins, which traditionally, I know in my field, traditionally voices from the margins were left on the margins. And trying to find space for them in a broader narrative I think is critically important. So there, there never seems to be enough right. done with the past, I think, yeah. I think it depends on what position you're coming from. I liked how you brought up this idea of a third generation um, because 
you know, when you think of how PTSD, oftentimes the children offspring are the recipients of a lot of the, sometimes comes out as violence. So it would be the next generation that maybe has the space or freedom or liberty and tools, especially right now. I see a lot of people having tools, whether it's the devices they use to kind of self-articulate. You can, it's very easy to kind of release your own images. Um, when I say self-articulate, meaning like you get to write your own history instead of someone. I remember hearing this expression that history is written by winners and it's very interesting to see how the narrative is presented based on whose like side it is. So I think sometimes it can be out of this longing desire to art mine your history, especially if you're a body on the margins. Um, so I think there's that. But then I do think there is also sometimes a danger to nostalgia as like a mode in like art making where you kind of get sort of trapped there or you romanticize it, you know, whether it's from people's mm -hmm. vintage clothing or trying to copy in your maybe politics something, the, the image that you see in like, the 60s, 70s, and a past time, whether it's identity politics, whatever it is, how you're trying to mirror that, including the things that maybe weren't working. So there's there's a danger to it as well, like it's slippery. Um, and then the other times where a romanticized history can also be problematic is depending on the institutional space it might be in. So, you know, um, depending on the kind of museum it might be, you know, if you see a, um, you can go to many exhibitions and they'll be showing indigenous art from all over the world and they kind of show in a way that relocates these bodies to the past as if they're not living here in the present. So, you know, it's tricky, but for me as like a second generation multiracial being, like for me, my it's hard for me not to, to get trapped in that or to be, go to that place because there's so much that's been lost. The majority of my family history only goes back two generations because there aren't really archives, so there's also a necessity for it, so. Um, but I think, like you were, just to riff off of what you are saying, I don't think there's any lack of work. There's people that, that's their mode of working. There's people that are work function and contemporary. There's, I don't think there's a lack of one over the other. Um, but yeah, I could see some apprehension about that, maybe. I can, I'm gonna show bias of my age and my generation. Uh, when I started my studies many centuries ago, you had to go to the library, go to the index, pick up the card, go to the librarian, show the card, come back next week for the photocopies that more often than not were not readable because they were all folded. Nowadays, ignorance is a choice. In the age of Google, ignorance is a choice. So it is conceivable, and I see it through this new generation, that you're creating art in vivo. If you go online and you go Facebook or Snapchat or the latest app I'm not aware of, that's art being formed and memories being formed in vivo. We used to have to go back to museums and art galleries to see masterpieces. Nowadays, in a second, you see it. I just showed you three works of art that are in very different places in the world without even having to move. So we are, in a sense, creating electronic, interconnected art in vivo. As we, as we talk, we're being taped right now. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. I hope we look OK. But that's instantaneous. That's instant memory. So the 10 generations from now, are going to look back at the material today in a much easier way, encoding in a much durable fashion, but with less interpretation. There will be much more concrete, less interpretation. That's, that's a danger. How much, you tell me, are we okay for time? Um, okay, uh, actually, I, w I had a, a question myself for the panel, um, and it's about cultural memory, which we've touched on, I would suggest, indirectly through this discussion tonight. But I, I'd like, with all three of you, actually, I'd, I'd love to hear how you feel, particularly after uh, Abe Snyderman gave us his, uh, his uh, scientific exploration for 101, um, 
how that relates to what we know of as cultural memory, or we think of as cultural memory. How does the work that he presented to us tonight um, shape the way you think about, or has it, does it come to shape the way you think about your own research or your own art production, for example? Um, yeah, I mean, I think about, I have a very maybe basic, I understand 101 level, um, but there are things that I think about a lot. So for me, like technology, if we're looking, if we're making digital images, just one mode of making. I still go to museums. I, f I think having a physical present art experience is always important, whether I'm seeing a live dance performance, a painting with all its textures, or even if it is a digital image, if that's the mode in which the person made the thing, it's still a real, like if that's what the material is they chose for the thing. Um, and then as far as like thinking of memory, I guess the way I play with it is I work a lot with time-based work and I'm very intentional about, one thing that comes up with that is people's attention span is like whatever the Instagram interval is, like one minute, 15 seconds. Um, but what I've intentionally done, so when I did this installation, you know, I know that I, so there was the one video which um, would have headphones on it, so you'd have to sit down and have kind of an intimate experience where only two people could listen to the headphones at once. And so that was a, a video, so you're kind of in your own role, but then there were performers that were dancing to the music that was in the space. So you would, there'd be moments of synchronicity where you'd be listening to a separate piece while there is an aura in the room and the dancers are moving, there'd be moments where they'd line up. And that was an intentional thing. So this video that was looping was five minutes the sound in the room was like a 20 minute track. And then there was in the corner, another audio piece where you'd have to fit headphones. So there's about like four different levels of experience you could have at any given moment. And those are ways in which I was playing kind of with time or memory. And there's a lot of things also outside of my control or power because when you're working with ephemera or what like you might call open works, uh, you have to be open to kind of confluence. Like there's things that are kind of outside of your like control. And I don't really want to be a master puppeteer. Like I want to suggest a way that you can move in a space, but I really want that to be, to also be open, to have it be a, like a dialectic. Um, so I, those are ways in which I play with time. It's a way of thinking of it as maybe a sculpting material to create like the turns or like the, the platform for an experience. There's, there's a new, new, a few years old field called epigenetics. You might have heard about it. It's a field that has discovered and works with the concept that your environment changes your genes. So depending on where you are, what you experience, what you go through, your DNA changes, which is mind-blowing. It, it's unbelievable, and that's the future. So culturally, experiences, historic experiences, transfer that to the genes, and that goes from generation to generation. It's how we ended up with opposable thumbs, for example, or without a tail. Um, but when you apply that to morality, to creativity, it's a Pandora's box. It's unbelievable. Say that again. Yes, but I'm very biased. So I think we can conclude the evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.